Good morning to those of you who are in Europe and uh, good afternoon to our Asian uh, attendees. I'm Yudhita Tariqa Magyar, country representative for Europe South Japan, and a very warm welcome to you all. This is the European Research Council grants for top researchers from anywhere in the world webinar. Uh, let me greet my uh, colleagues first. I would like to welcome uh, Jenny Belmarco, who is the regional representative for uh, Eurosas ASEAN. Uh, Tatsuya Maisawa for Eurosas Japan in Kobe, and um, Thomas Vyarzhovsky from Eurosas Korea. Welcome you all. And uh, our speakers today are Laura Panda, uh, Keita Ito, and Susanna Gotovac Atleji, who are going to talk in our webinar, and I will introduce them uh, more extensively in a few minutes. Thank you for joining our webinar today. This is a collaborative event between Eurosas Japan, Singapore, and South Korea. The ERC is one of the most prominent European funding organizations for breakthrough research. It doesn't only support frontier research across all fields, but also awards grants to scientists and scholars from all over the world. So we are going to hear about uh, ERC grants and especially about the consolidated grant in this webinar. So if I may just... Uh, If I may just welcome you all. Thank you for listening. And uh, our first speaker today, our first speaker today is ERC grantee uh, Keita Ito. And he received his doctorate in medical engineering and medical physics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and his medical degree from Harvard Medical School. Currently, he's vice dean and full professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at the Eindhoven University of Technology, where he leads the orthopedic biomechanics group. This group actually combines, the gen, uh, combines numerical, experimental and engineering biological methods to elucidate degenerative processes in bone, cartilage, disc and tendon ligaments, as well as regenerative strategies thereof. He is also a professor at the Department of Orthopedics at the University Medical Center Utrecht, where he works on the um, mechanobiology of Moscow skeletal regenerative medicine. He has co-authored over 200 peer-reviewed publications and is on the editorial board of the Biomac model Mechanobile and is a deputy editor of the Global Spine Journal. Recently, he was awarded an ERC um, ADG to investigate to uh, the etiology of adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Well, Professor, it's a very extensive list of uh, achievements. Uh, I could uh, barely wrap my uh, tongue around them. So thank you very much for joining today and um, please proceed with your presentation. Okay, thank you for the very nice introduction. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen here. I think you should be able to see that now. Uh, yes, it's working perfectly. Thank you so much. Okay, so yeah, good morning and good afternoon to, to everybody. Uh, thank you for joining the webinar. So uh, as uh, Judith uh, introduced me, I'm here to uh, give some tips uh, for ERC advanced grant uh, applications uh, for applicants from uh, Japan, uh, South Korea, and Singapore. Um, so let's see, let's get started. So I tell you a little bit about my research field. Um, so as you introduced me, um, my field is orthopedic biomechanics and mechanobiology. So I think I should explain that uh, for the general audience. So uh, in terms of orthopedics, um, it's really defined by sort of the tissues that I work on. So the tissues are basically bone, cartilage, uh, intervertebral disc in your spine, and tendons and ligaments. I think most of you are, fi uh, are familiar with these tissues because uh, yeah, they cause a lot of problems. Uh, in terms of mechanobiology, um, that really means that I'm interested in the physical environment and how that physical environment guides or drives biological behavior uh, of the cells inside of this tissue or these tissues. And in terms of biomechanics, uh, it's the other way around. I'm interested in how biological behavior of these tissues uh, changes its mechanical properties 
and therefore its function, because in orthopedics, all of these tissues basically have a biomechanical function. Now, uh, what we know in our world today is in many parts of the world, we have an aging population, especially so in countries like uh, Japan and South Korea. And because of that, uh, degenerative diseases are diseases that are coming more to the forefront and creating a lot of socioeconomic burden. Um, so these are diseases like um, osteoarthritis for your cartilage or osteoporosis in your bone. And so one of the things I like to do is I like to try to figure out uh, what causes these uh, degenerative diseases and the processes that are involved. And I also like to develop regenerative strategies that will try to cure uh, these diseases or at least prevent them. And as Judith mentioned, uh, I use both uh, numerical tools as well as experimental ones. And I'm interested in both engineering and biological methods. So that's kind of what I do uh, as a scientist. Um, so uh, she told you a little bit about my background, but uh, I am originally from Japan. I was born in the northern city Sapporo in the northern island of Hokkaido. Uh, and in 94, 95, as she explained, I got my uh, PhD and my MD, uh, both uh, in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. But then uh, in 1995, soon after I got my degrees, I left for Switzerland. And that was the first time that I came to Europe in my life. Uh, and I was at the AO Research Institute uh, for all of those years, uh, first as a postdoc, and then I became a group leader and a vice director there. And also during that time, I completed or completed, uh, I finished as much of my uh, clinical training as I wanted to. Uh, I was a fellow for two years at the orthopedic surgery department uh, at the Inz Hospital at the University of Bern. And then in 2007, I made a big change in that I moved to the Netherlands uh, and I took on a position as a professor. And I've been here ever since. And I've become now recently the vice dean at the Department of Biomedical Engineering here in Eindhoven. And I also have a position as a professor in orthopedics at a university medical center in Utrecht. And so what you kind of see in this sort of uh, slide is my career path. But what you see is that every single location that I've been in ever since my um, finishing my studies, I've sort of had this dual sort of line between engineering and medicine. And that comes back when I explained to you my, my ERC advance grant and how I took advantage of that. Um, so my career path, but also my life is a little bit unusual in the sense that I had a very unorthodox uh, childhood. Uh, my father was an academic, he was a theoretical mathematician. Uh, and because of his career, he took us the entire family back and forth between Japan and the United States. So I grew up uh, bilingually. So as you can hear, I speak Midwestern American English, uh, but I also grew up biculturally. And if I think about it, Japan and the United States uh, really don't have that much in common in terms of culture and language. Uh, but I, got, I think I got the best out of both worlds in the sense that I was given, um, uh, well, I developed, a, 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 let's say, a, respect uh, for uh, tradition and for uh, convention. Um, and, but at the same time, I value individualism. I think uh, my parents uh, in my environment uh, pushed me to uh, explore my boundaries and to think more out of the box uh, than I would have if I had lived and grown up in Japan. And I think these things have infected my, my career. Uh, early on, both at, um, in Boston as well as in uh, Switzerland, I had very good mentors. Uh, those mentors uh, challenged me uh, quite a bit, uh, but they also gave me a lot of freedom uh, also to fail. Um, but they fostered my curiosity and they really supported my interdisciplinary nature. Um, and I think uh, all those years in the USA, Switzerland, and in the Netherlands, I was searching for some kind of balance in my career between my interests in engineering and, and in medicine. Um, I think uh, even recently in my career, I still have this sort of curiosity-driven uh, research motivation. I like really looking at unsolved questions. Uh, but at the same time, as I mature, I also start to understand that 
one of my uh, greatest legacies will be the people that I train. Uh, so training new generation of uh, scientists and engineers is quite important to me. And I also start to think about how I can sustain the research in my own environment, my local environment. And I've gotten involved in larger programs to benefit not only myself, but also my colleagues. Um, I think my career has been also affected by the fact that I have a Dutch partner uh, and we have uh, two daughters uh, and my family and my children have really uh, affected me in terms of the decisions that I've made in my career. So that's me. What about the ERC Advanced Grant? Well, um, I think it's a very unique grant uh, in the sense that it's an award for senior scientists. It's uh, really for high risk, high gain research and it's for fundamental research. But even then, I still think it's quite different than other grants um, in several senses. Uh, it's a personal grant. It's not institute bound. So if I were to change institutions, it would follow me. Uh, and it's really a, based quite a bit on personal performance as well as uh, scientific excellence of the project. Um, I think uh, the impact that they're looking for is mostly scientific, but it also needs to have societal and economic impact. Uh, it's really about fundamental research. It's curiosity driven. Uh, it's fairly a large award. So it has about 2 million in direct costs that it covers and about half a million in overhead. And even you can add on about a half million in terms of special costs if you have them. Um, it's really about uh, the science. Uh, there's no consortium involved, uh, there's no public-private funding, uh, there's no training of others that you need to do, uh, and uh, you don't have to explain uh, the exploitations of any ideas that you may uh, derive in your research. The other thing is, is that the ERC advanced grants, at least for me, can have a, quite a benefit in terms of your career. Um, in Europe, it's uh, a recognition to receive an ad advanced grant. Uh, it's an honor uh, from your peers. Um, it helps in your career advancement. And I think it can have more knock-on effects that you can take it advantage of. Um, so that's in general the ERC advanced grant, at least the way I see it. Um, but there are some key points that I would like to, to point out to you uh, in terms of the project. I think. Uh, above all, the project needs to be of the highest scientific quality. But at the same time, it has to be highly innovative. Uh, again, we come back to the high risk, high gain nature of what you propose. Um, it has to be intriguing. It has to really catch uh, the reviewers and evaluators eye. And there needs to be what I call a, a wow factor in it. Um, the strategy of your uh, application really needs to be obvious and clear. Um, the methods you proposed uh, need to be the most advanced methods as well as even proposing new ones. I think uh, the team that you, and I'll come back to this, needs to be really excellent and they need to support you as the applicant. Uh, and I think of them as sort of plugging the dike. So we all have weaknesses as scientists uh, and those weaknesses will come out as threats uh, when evaluators look at your uh, grant application. So you need the team uh, to plug the dike in terms of those weaknesses. Uh, for example, if one of my weaknesses was molecular biology, then I have to think about bringing a molecular biologist onto the team. Um, above all, the uh, grant has to be understandable. Uh, so it's not just uh, the experts uh, in your field who will be uh, looking at your grant. It's also general scientists. They're all of the highest quality, but they're still not experts in your field. So the message has to be simple, both uh, in an implicit as well as in an explicit form. Uh, it is a personal grant, so you have to make your own CV attractive. Um, you need to substantiate the excellence in your field, and these could be through awards, uh, fellowships, or invited presentations. Uh, you need to show that you're a leader in your field, so this could be through your activities in societies or uh, journals. And you'll have to list uh, 10 publications from the last 10 years. So this is not your publication list of, from your CV. There's only 10 publications you can put down. Um, so you have to choose carefully. Uh, they should come from the highest impact journals of your field, 
uh, and you'll need to explain the impact of each of these publications. Um, and above all, I think in order to make an attractive CV, you need to make a CV which will make you stand out. So you need a strategy for that. Uh, the advanced grant takes lots of time to write, so you should reserve that uh, in your agenda. And I think that every scientist, although they feel that they can you know, do this, you shouldn't do it alone. Uh, you need to gather a lot of support and you should do that early on. And I think uh, that was one of the most helpful things uh, that I found from, from Laura, who was my support from the research support office at my university. But I'll come back to that. Um, so what is my ERC advanced grant? Well, it has the name Scoli Storm. And the title of the grant is Adolescent Idiopathic Scoliosis, a Perfect Storm of Functional Anatomy, Biomechanics, and Mechanobiology During Growth, which is quite a mouthful for the person who doesn't understand this. But basically, uh, what the figure on the right that you see, uh, this is a, a deformity of the spine, uh, which we call scoliosis. And the disease that I'm interested in is a, a disease of unknown cause uh, that occurs in uh, adolescents, mostly growing girls. And the whole point of my application was that I proposed a hypothesis uh, where all of these factors, uh, anatomy, biomechanics, and mechanobiology during the period of growth uh, would come into play to actually cause the scoliosis. So basically, after my research is done, hopefully it won't be so idiopathic anymore. Um, the panel, so every time you write one of these grants, it's going to be going to a particular panel for evaluation. And the panel that I had my grant, uh, let's say, submitted to was PE8, and they handle product and process engineering. And then there's a sub panel within PE8, which was 08, and they covered materials engineering, including biomaterials. Uh, and so that's where my sort of application fit in the best. Um, one of the tricks that I was told is that you should not try to go outside of your field. So for me, I'm still based as a biomedical engineer, so, and I could have gone more towards the life sciences, but I chose to stay in the engineering field because it fit me better. Um, I uh, submitted in August 2020, which was the year of uh, when corona pandemic started, uh, and it was approved in April 2021. And it started in October 21, and so about a year ago, and it will run until September 2026. So it's a five-year uh, grant. Um, the budget for my uh, advanced grant was 2.74 million. Of about 1.4 million was for personnel. There was about 400K for uh, direct costs, about a half a million for indirect costs, there was also 150 million for doing some subcontracting done. And there was an additional 250K, which was basically to cover the MRIs uh, during our clinical study. So what was sort of the secret of success that at least from my perspective about my application relative to sort of the key points that I outlined earlier. So in terms of the project, uh, what I was proposing was a hypothesis that would actually solve an unsolved mystery. And in my case, this is a, the cause of AIS, which has been unknown since about 400 BC uh, when it was first discovered. Uh, and uh, I tried to make the uh, work as innovative by, as possible by making it cross-disciplinary. So I was uh, basically proposing to bring in uh, work from uh, the clinical world, as well as biology, imaging, computer modeling, and artificial intelligence. Uh, I tried to make it as high risk and high gain as possible uh, by explaining the complexity of the methods involved, the fact that it was an orphan disease, which is rarely studied, but the fact that if I was successful, that I would, uh, uh, well, the information that I came up with would could be used for a potential cure or prevention of this disease. And I also tried to make it as intriguing as possible by explaining a rather complex hypothesis uh, and making my research hypothesis driven, and also making it unique in the sense that I was proposing to do my research uh, using uh, humans or human tissue. Um, the strategy that I had was to basically accentuate the multidisciplinary approach, which is actually quite unique to this field. 
Uh, and it was also trying to match my uniqueness, combining uh, engineering and, and medicine. Um, in terms of the methods that I choose, I, choose, I chose to use advanced and new methods, uh, things like uh, machine-based learning for imaging. Uh, I tried to do a clinical study in a very unique patient population that would not normally be approached. I used, uh, develop, I used new tissue platforms that we had developed uh, in our group. Uh, we applied advanced biological techniques, some of which were new to our group. Uh, we did a lot of, uh, proposed to do a lot of patient-specific uh, modeling, uh, and even to combine that with uh, data-driven uh, patient models. The team uh, that I chose to support me, uh, they were also multidisciplinary. So I had physicists, uh, spine surgeons, computational experts. I also included young colleagues that I wanted to sort of advance and uh, artificial intelligence and data scientists. And not all of these uh, fields, uh, let's say, were my weaknesses, but I thought I could sort of, you know, take advantage of them uh, to strengthen the application. Um, now, in order to make the whole thing understandable, uh, the, I think the key person in all of this was my research support officer, uh, Laura Pander, that you'll hear from uh, later on. Um, she is not an expert in my field, and that was the godsend because she would read my applications or she would read the text that I would write and she would really push me to make it more simple and more understandable to highlight uh, certain things that I needed to bring out further. And I think without her, I probably wouldn't have gotten the advanced grant. Um, to make my CV as attractive as possible, I matched my personal profile to the proposal strategy and vice versa, sort of this interdisciplinariness between engineering and, and medicine. Um, in Europe, I stand out uh, in terms of my profile as being a clinician uh, engineer, and I tried to take advantage of that. And in my publications, my 10 publications I listed, I tried to make it more of a narrative in terms of uh, scientific impact and how I went through these different points, uh, basically leading me uh, to my advanced grant application. So how did I actually prepare? Well, there are some warnings that I have for you, which is that it takes quite a bit of time. So I started thinking about an advanced grant almost two to three years in advance. I started uh, reading about and listening to uh, what the rules of the grant were. Um, and I also looked at projects that were awarded and not awarded from my colleagues to try to get an understanding of what um, the evaluation committees were looking for. And of course, I started to think, okay, do I have enough honors? Do I have enough awards to substantiate that I'm a leader in my field? And if I didn't, then I tried to look to see how I could gain those. Um, I went through a lot of ideas. I first started thinking about, okay, what are the hot topics in my field? What kind of new methods do I want to use? And I read, I spent many, many hours uh, reading the literature. I think I worked through maybe about 10 different ideas where I formulated them. And then basically for one reason or another, I ended up throwing them out until I came to my final idea. Um, I got uh, examples of successful uh, advanced grant applications. Uh, and I looked at them as examples of, of what I needed to do. And from them, I determined sort of a structure of how I wanted to write my grant application. Uh, I think, I don't know how many times I rewrote my application, uh, this and, but this was over a period of about four months from about May to August. Uh, and while I was uh, rewriting and rewriting my application, I didn't really stop reading. And in fact, I think two or three of my ideas of what I wanted to do actually came up during that time as I was reading. Uh, and of course, I think everybody, because it's a long haul process, it takes about four months or so, you need some kind of a source of inspiration uh, to, do, to keep plugging away at this. Uh, and what's a, a little bit strange for me was my source of inspiration was the corona pandemic. Uh, I wrote this during the time that we were kind of in lockdown, we were all staying at home. Uh, and this was kind of my way of keeping in touch with people and, and thinking about science. Um, 
The support team, uh, you need to uh, exploit them for your advantage. I had a writing team. Uh, these were sort of my co-applicants or the support team that I had in terms of scientists. Um, they were very diverse and that was good. They were also a little bit contradictory. So I would send like a piece of writing to several people and they would all come back to me with advice. And some of them were actually opposed to each other. And that was really good because then I could sit down and try to figure out where they're coming from and to see what I wanted to do with their criticisms. Uh, so it was also important that I did this in parallel and not sequentially because then I wouldn't have seen this contrast. Um, the university support that I received was tremendous. So for budgeting, I had controllers that were looking at my budget. Uh, people at the research services office like Laura were providing me support and advice. I also, because I had a clinical study, uh, I needed to involve uh, ethicists. And I also had facility managers uh, for different kinds of uh, facilities that I wanted to use for my research also involved. And so these people all had very great advice that I could put into my application. Um, so that's mostly the tips that I had for you uh, about um, how to prepare and what's involved. But I also wanted to uh, leave off with one slide to tell you about what potential benefits you can actually have from receiving an advanced grant award. Uh, for me, uh, there was actually quite a bit of prestige involved, but also it was a kind of a bit of a personal validation uh, that actually uh, I am a good scientist uh, and that I can do fundamental work. Uh, it was an opportunity for me to work on sort of a dream project of mine uh, that, so it gives me a lot of motivation. Uh, it provides the resources that I need to explore new methods and even to purchase new equipment. Uh, and it also gives me a little bit of breathing room. So in academia, there's a constant uh, sort of stress or um, need to get grants, to bring in money, to sustain your research. And with such a large award, it gives me a little bit of breathing room where I don't need to do that. Uh, it also, surprisingly, uh, with the prestige that comes with it, it gave me uh, less administration uh, and actually more support to carry out that administration. Um, it also provides me the opportunity to train young scientists and to pass along knowledge uh, and my love of science to them. So I think that's a great opportunity. And there is a, this sort of domino effect or knock-on effect. Uh, it's allowed me to apply for other grants, to create new collaborations, uh, to expand my network uh, with uh, this uh, award. Uh, and I think that's a tremendous benefit uh, even for senior scientists. So with that, I think that is the end of my presentation and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions later on. So I'll stop sharing to turn it back to the moderator. Thank you so much. Uh, these were excellent tips, a very extensive explanation and uh, help, very practical advice to all applicants. And um, I can say that I've never heard such a detailed and a, a useful list of how to proceed with the, the writing process. And I believe this could also be applied to several other grant applications, not a, a specific to the uh, ERC uh, grants. So thank you very much. And uh, we are going to go ahead with the presentation of uh, Laura Pande, who supported uh, Keita Ito uh, in his uh, application and the writing process. Laura Pander is coordinator for personal grants like ERC and Maris Philips Coffee Reactions, uh, the NWO Talent Scheme, in the Research Support Office of Eindhoven University of Technology since uh, 2017. She is mainly involved in pre award support of personal grant applicants, but she and her colleagues also help out for grant agreement preparations and post award support. Laura studied religious studies and philosophy at Radboud University and the University of Edinburgh, and she has worked at several Dutch universities as an EU project manager and grant advisor in both technical and SSH domains. It's Laura's drive to help researchers to grow in their personal research strategy and to stimulate them to reach their research ambitions. And how successful she has been at that, um, Professor Keita Ito is actually a, a proof and uh, Laura, if you could please 
proceed with your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you for the nice introduction and your kind words. Let me see if I can share my presentation. Here it is. So thank you for this opportunity to tell you about my work and um, what it entails research report. So my name is Laura Pomber. I work at the research report office at Eindhoven University. Um, let's see if I can go to the next slide. Yes, here we are. So first about uh, Eindhoven University of Technology. We are um, a relatively young university, only established in 1956. And we have about 13,000 uh, students at the moment, but we are actually in a quite unique uh, ecosystem, uh, a unique high-tech environment in the south of the Netherlands, an economic hotspot. Um, and you probably have heard of uh, companies like ASML and Philips, ProDrive, uh, and this gives um, the university quite unique opportunities for collaboration. At the same time, we also collaborate, of course, with other universities and medical hospitals in the Netherlands. So um, ERC grants are very important for the university because um, it says something about the quality of the research performed, the quality of the researchers that we employ. So here you see some numbers uh, for the starting grant, the consolidator and the advanced. And I think it is also curious to see that we are actually more successful in obtaining advanced grants. So this is for very senior researchers um, than we are for consolidator grants. Um, and you can look up the numbers in the project yourself in the ERC database. I gave the link below. And I think it would be actually quite nice if you're thinking about applying for an ERC grant to look at what kind of projects have been uh, funded previously, not only at your Eindhoven, but just in your specific field or niche. So just to uh, explain a little bit about uh, Tio Eindhoven, how research support is organized. So I am working on the central level in the research support office, um, and we have a research support network at the university. This means that there are both people on the central level like myself, but there are also people working in the departments who are maybe closer to the scientists um, who might have more in-depth knowledge about the content of the research and maybe also funding opportunities for a thematic call. So they can really focus on the expertise within their department. But at the same time, the research support network is also collaborating with other parts of the university, for instance, the community education uh, center, but also uh, people who deal with ethics, um, information support, IT support, um, legal support. Uh, so um, we try to um, have the scientists at the center of the support that we are trying to provide, because we think it is about making their life easier so that they can focus on the research and be successful in their application. Um, I think this was already um, made clear by uh, Professor Ito as well, but it is very important that if you're considering to apply for a grant, so not only for ERC, but also for Marie Curie or any other kind of personal grant that you would take an interest in, is to think about what is your ambition uh, and how does that fit with your track record? And then think about the specific problem that you want to um, address. So it will be very important to include in your application how you feel that you are the best person to really address the, the scientific challenge in your field. And that um, will help to, to determine the scope of your project, your specific focus. Um, and, and also to explain to maybe a broader audience what you're actually trying to do and why this is innovative, why this is a groundbreaking idea in, in your field. Because as Professor Ito already explained, it will be very important to explain to the evaluation panel, but also your external reviewers, why you think that this could have a tremendous scientific impact on progress in your field. So the kind of support that we provide at Eindhoven University, but I think a lot of European universities and research institute will offer similar support if you would be interested in uh, applying for an ERC grant with them. 
So um, we could start, for instance, with individual advice, because it will be very important to determine whether you are actually ready. Uh, so it could take some time, even years, um, before you feel that you're ready to um, go ahead with the application. It has to be, uh, your track record has to be like, uh, top, but also uh, the research idea should be quite mature and, and thought through. Um, so we offer at some point also how to write trainings with an external consultant, uh, which is not only to um, explain the guidelines once more, but also to help you get started. So what is ERC looking for and how to translate that, so to speak, to an application written on paper? And that's why we also offer project idea development. So, so how to get idea out of your head uh, and how to explain this to people who are not from your field and, and see whether they get enthusiastic about your idea as well. Um, we offer proposal review. So um, what we do, like we are not um, focusing on the content. You have your peers for that who can really assess whether this is uh, innovative and groundbreaking and new to the field and whether uh, the methods that you propose are indeed the right ones. But we um, try to establish whether indeed this would fit in terms of ambition in the ERC program. So how, what kind of elements you should emphasize. Uh, so for instance, how to focus on the scientific um, impact that you're uh, trying to achieve with your um, proposal. And um, after the um, deadline for submission, if you're invited for the interview, we also provide interview training. So of course, you're, you're used to presenting your ideas for an audience during uh, congresses uh, or, or do teaching, but um, to do an interview for the ERC, it, it's a different uh, kind of thing to do. So we try to um, put laureates um, and maybe other people who have experience in, in doing such a scientific interview um, uh, to put them together and also practice the, the Q&A, for instance. So how, what are right answers and, and how to have a professional debate when there is so much at stake. So apart from um, helping you as an applicant uh, in preparing your application, we also provide other support. Um, you have to submit in an online system, the participant portal, and this is quite complex if you have never seen it. So um, we deal with the system on a daily ba basis, so usually we know where to click or where to put information, so we can help you with that. Uh, but we also have colleagues who can help you drafting a budget um, because it is quite decisive whether you can have like two or three PhD students, uh, whether there is still room in the budget for to have another uh, uh, postdoc involved in the project. Um, so you can have different scenarios and we are happy to help you with that as well. Uh, so. Um, it is also important to uh, know whether you have access to the research infrastructure, uh, how to deal with ethics. Uh, research data management is a very important topic uh, related to open science and open access, of course. Uh, and maybe there are also some legal issues uh, for collaborations that should be taken care of. So these are all other kinds of aspects that we can help you with at the, the university or the research institute that you would like to apply for. Um, and I think something that is very important that you should not forget, like you can um, apply uh, with for an ERC from outside of Europe, but you need to have a host letter in which the university or the institute that's going to host you, so the host organization, is actually acknowledging that indeed they want to host you for the period of the grant. So this is a formal letter and it should be signed uh, by um, uh, the host representative uh, of the host organization. And this can take some time as well before you get from the people in the department or the group that you would like to work to the host representative to make sure that they will sign the letter in time. Um, so, so at some point there's going to be a result of the evaluation and we do not only provide uh, support before the deadline but also after. So if your proposal is successful we can help you with the grant agreement at preparation so there have to be made some adjustments to the proposal and, and some further documents to be signed and everything has to be implemented in the organization. 
Um, but if you're unsuccessful, but even if you're successful, we can also help you with an analysis of the evaluation report. So what happened? Um, what were, was the, the main message? Uh, why the proposal was rejected or accepted? So, so this will give you some helpful information maybe for future applications as well. So it's not that um, uh, you should stop um, if you get rejected or if the proposal gets funded, but it is very interesting to see how other people evaluate or perceive your proposal, whether they could get the message or not. So it is very important to think about the embedding because the ERC um, is a project for yourself, it's a personal grant, you will have your own budget, but it will be very important to make sure that the project is successful because it is embedded um very strongly within the department or the group or the organization that you want to work with so there is for instance the hr department um who of course has to employ you so there are some arrangements to make but they can also help you in recruiting the team members which are processes which are very important because you need of course to have the most talented people in order to help you with this very ambitious project so how to get to the right type of researchers to make sure that you really can scout for talent um, then there's, of course, in the, the organization, uh, you need support for ad administration, also IT, uh, for finance and reporting, so somebody has to keep the books to make sure that everything um, is being recorded and that you know how much money is spent and how much money is left in the budget. Uh, maybe you need some support for uh, lab management and the research access to re research infrastructure, for instance, uh, access to the clean room or specific equipment. Um, and if you're doing uh, medical research or, or you're going to interview people, so research with or on humans, you also need ethical support. So people who will provide you with an approval. So this means that the organization um, that your research is applying with the rules within uh, European national and, and local um, regulations. Um, and it could be that you uh, need uh, updates of the approval and monitoring of your project during the, um, the process of uh, execution of the project. Um, and at Eindhoven University, and I think this is something that most organizations will offer, is that we also have uh, specific uh, support, dedicated support for research data management, open science and open access. Last but not least, I think it's also very important to think about communication of your project. So um, it's a very prestigious grant, uh, so the organization would like to communicate that you were um, that the project has been funded, but I think during the, the obtaining of the results, it's also important to think about communication, not only to your peers, but maybe also to the general public. Um, and most organizations are happy to uh, publish um, an interview or uh, a, a news item about a, a new result that you have uh, achieved. So um, if you're applying from outside of Europe and um, you're going to be successful, there's also support that we provide for uh, researchers from abroad or from outside of Europe coming to the Netherlands. So I already mentioned HR, um, who can also deal with, uh, for instance, uh, help you with visa or taxes and social security, which is quite important, how to pay your pension fees, for instance. Um, and there could be schemes available at your organization to encourage researchers like in Eindhoven, we would like to attract more talented women to the university. So we have an additional program, the Irene Curie Fellowship Program, that could be of interest to have a look at. Um, we also offer support if you're going to bring a partner. So um, it's important that your family feels at home in the new country or um, your working environment, but the, the surroundings as well. So we have a spouse program um, and there could be um, other uh, initiatives for providing social activities. Um, so we also offer practical and administrative support also, for instance, um, uh, your health insurance, uh, how to open a bank account, uh, how to register at your municipality, for instance. Uh, and it's very important, as I already mentioned, that you uh, become 
part of the community. So um, at Eindhoven University or in Eindhoven, the city, uh, because we have such a, an in, uh, international hotspot, because there are a lot of people from outside of the Netherlands, but also out of, outside of Europe coming in, um, I must admit that there is this very vibrant international community and um, that there are social activities, but also sports and schools. Uh, so this makes it easier to feel at home in the new environment. So actually, that is the end of my uh, presentation. I hope that I gave some insight in what, um, well, Eindhoven University, but I think also other organizations within Europe can do for you when you're considering to apply with uh, a European organization for your ERC advanced grant. So thank you for your time and your attention. Thank you so much, Laura. Mm. Again, very useful points and a very extensively well-described uh, presentation about the ERC grants. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, our last presentation today is from ERC NCP, uh, Susanna gotovac Atlargic, and she has graduated at the Faculty of Technology uh, at her home country in her home country of Bosnia Herzegovina in 1999, and since then she completed her Master's in Humanities and Environmental Sciences and a PhD in Science and Technology in Switzerland and Japan. Her study periods included stays at Otanomizu University, Neustadt University and Chiba University. After working at teaching as a, as a teaching assistant and obtaining her PhD abroad, she returned home in 2007 and worked at the National Wastewater Laboratory for eight years. From 2015, she has been a teacher at the University of Banja Luka, chemistry department, running national and international projects, environmental nanotechnologies. Her team was awarded the best scientific team national award for the last four years in a, in a, low, uh, in a row. And due to the number of extensive project activities, um, international exchange publications and industrial collaboration. She is a strong advocate for repatriation of Bosnian scientists, studying abroad, following with great attention the Bosnian economic recovery and numerous foreign industrial investments in the country, actively running the National Association of Engineers of Technology as the president of its assembly. She is the ERC NCP in her country, and she's going to talk about, um, to, to talk to our audience in that capacity today. So, Susanna, if you could please share your slides. Yeah, thank you very much. Just a moment, please. Thank you. And let me just uh, remind the audience in the meantime that I've sent you a chat. If you could please uh, share any questions you may have um, in the Q&A box. Uh, we already have three questions, so please type them up and we'll do our best to spend a few minutes um, at the end of the webinar to, to answer them. Okay. Yes, your presentation is beaming okay. up perfectly. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. So I will continue. Thank you for the nice introduction of myself. So it's really interesting to see this uh, opposite case of Professor Ito, who was actually a Japanese scholar who came to Europe. I was a young scientist at the time, and I spent a significant time in Japan, as you could see. So uh, it's uh, for the beginning, I will just start with a little bit of geography, because for our Asian colleagues who are listening to today's presentation, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina could be a little a bit strange term because it's a really, really small country. But as you can see on this map, it's a hard shaped country uh, somewhere south of the Europe. And uh, at this moment, it's still not a member of European Union. But just yesterday, we received wonderful news. We are recommended to become a candidate. So um, all the legislation and developments in the country are heading towards the European integration of our country. But the most important fact for you, colleagues from Asia who are listening today, is that Bosnia and Herzegovina is eligible in the ERC program. So you can either come to Bosnia and Herzegovina to study, so we can host you at one of our universities or institutes. And on the other hand, for our young scientists, uh, ERC is giving you 
opportunity to apply on each level that my colleagues have described previously. Uh, you, my CV, you could hear from the colleagues, but uh, obviously the studying in four different countries was really uh, rewarding and exciting for me to learn more about different cultures. I learned Japanese, I speak it fluently and had really wonderful time in Japan. I also speak French language, uh, which I learned during my uh, stay in Switzerland, which again gave me a new opportunity to learn more about European countries. But nevertheless, last 15 years, I'm living in my home country. I established my own family. I have three little daughters <laughs> trying to set an example as a woman in science. But also, I'm, of course, giving my best, a lot of my energy into the development of the scientific communities in my country. But uh, just to, to encourage you a little bit to come to Europe to study, being in Bosnia and Herzegovina or any other country, you will potentially come through the ERC program. I'm giving you a few glimpses of my student life in Japan and how really, really rewarding it is to be far away from home. Because as you can see from these pictures of my friends, my host family with whom I lived in Japan and everything, it's really discovering how people are same we are all the same and really uh, your life changes completely if you study for a while far from home because you understand that the whole planet is a home actually uh, nevertheless it is maybe important at least from my perspective uh, to go back home after studying for a few years abroad because then you can bring the best out of the society in which you have actually spent your time. In my case, of course, this is very, very contrasting because as you might know from the history, uh, my home country of Bosnia and Herzegovina had had a, a civil war about 30 years ago. But Japan, of course, is wonderful and most advanced country in terms of technology, which I studied there. So bringing this very, very advanced knowledge, especially in the area of nanotechnology, where I specialize, bringing it back to Bosnia, it was really a sensation because at the time when I returned home 15 years ago, we didn't even have a subject at the university. Nobody was teaching nanotechnologies and I was the only PhD in nanotechnologies at the time. But nevertheless, in these 15 years, I really managed to establish first the subjects. We started to talk about it. We started to teach about nanotechnologies. And in these years, I sent three of my students to Japan. They obtained PhD, all of them and return home. So we now have a wonderful community here. So any of you who might like to study nanotechnologies, I'm going to invite you to come to Bosnia, no matter how unusual it might sound from the moment. Uh, why I'm inviting you home uh, to my home country? It's because it's really interesting a case with, with a very high development in industry. Bosnia is a small country, but still see here on these slides, for example, you see the factory which is producing silicon metal for international market. And sometimes this factory is the strongest one on the international market from time to time. Then again, we have wonderful uh, mining industry in terms of iron, zinc, bauxite, copper, and different mining activities. But still, our mines are combining domestic and international investments and practicing the green mining, which is really a good practice, preserving the environment, but still, you know, uh, getting to the natural resources. And in my case, of course, it's an exciting opportunity to try to uh, develop Bosnian nanotechnologies. And we do have examples of wonderful factories doing a very good job, especially producing the nanoporous materials. I even obtained my recent patent in this area, practically turning waste from the iron mine into the uh, very nicely and high quality crystalline nanomaterials. So, um, why I was chosen by my country to become the national contact point for ERC, uh, not just because of this international experience that I have, obviously, but because also I was selected uh, seven years ago, I was selected as a delegate in one other funding scheme in European Union. It's the Cost Association. I was the representative of Bosnia in Cost Association Scientific Committee. So I really gave my best to, to motivate Bosnian scientists to get involved into this 
funding scheme, which is actually the networking tool and helping them internationalize their work and connect with scientists from all around the world, of course, especially with Europe. And uh, I could really set my success in that term into numbers, because when I took the, the chair, it was 91 uh, cost project to cost action where Bosnia was involved. But when I left seven years later, it was 244 actions in which Bosnian scientists were participating, but the actual number of people was five-fold increased. So I was really, really happy and it was a rewarding experience, but now I'm facing a challenge. <laughs> As you could see, the ERC grant is really demanding preparation of the grant and the scientists really have to be already excellent in his field. But I, I'm really sure that during my term in following seven years, I might be able to motivate some of my colleagues of all generations to first to apply, of course, to try their luck and maybe even gain first ERC for Bosnia. So not just my colleagues from Bosnia, but also you, dear colleagues from all around Asia. I'm not talking just about Japan, because in Japan, I had opportunity to meet wonderful students from Korea, from Singapore, also, of course, from China, from Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, all Asian countries. So Asia is in my heart, of course. And it would be even more exciting to host some of you to come to Bosnia and Herzegovina as an ERC grantee. Uh, just like I told you, Bosnia is a small country with a very, very diverse mineral resources, which are very exciting for different kinds of technologies. So there's plenty, plenty of potential to write the nice ERC proposal here. But on the other hand, not just in technologies or technical sciences, also in social sciences, psychology, politicology, any kind of science is of course, uh, viable to write the ERC proposal. So, for example, for some historian, from some of you who are sociologists, it can be an incredibly exciting topic to learn why is Bosnia so unique in political terms? Because that's the country where the horrific civil war took place 30 years ago for three years in a row. But when the peace came into this country, peace really came peace came and people of different ethnicities who were fighting in the war just started to look for each other and give hands to each other. And we have a perfect peace for 27 years. We are one of the safest country in the Europe. And this is very unique because otherwise in different countries where such kind of things occurs, you would have instability for years or sometimes for decades. But no, in Bosnia, you have wonderful development, both in industrial sector and also in cultural and in tourism. We are becoming a tourist maker of Europe, hosting millions of tourists coming to see our very diverse and complicated culture. But nevertheless, it can be also a very, very exciting topic for some of you who are in social or humanities sciences. So I really thank you very much. And once again, I would really like you to feel welcome to Europe, both in Bosnia and Herzegovina or in any other country, and maybe take ERC as your opportunity to do so and spend years here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susanna. That was, again, a great explanation about uh, uh, what ERC grants are really all about. And uh, I would like to encourage our audience to uh, follow her example uh, and uh, basically serve not only as an ERC grantee, uh, but also to help others in subsequent years to uh, secure similar grants. Thank you so much. So those of you who would like to ask questions from our distinguished speakers, can you please type your questions in the uh, Q&A box. Uh, we already have one answered question by my colleague uh, Thomas in Korea. So apparently the question was, is South Korea eligible to receive an ERC grant and host an ERC researcher? And if yes, would it be possible for a co-PI um, of awarded project to move to an European organization during the project? And the answer was at this stage, Korea cannot host an ERC grantee, but researchers based in South Korea are eligible to receive ERC grant and they have to spend at least 50% of the project lifespan in European hosting this institution. So thank you for that. Um, 
let's have a look at uh, some uh, other questions in the meantime. Okay, so the first open question um, and also the second and the third are from uh, the same uh, person uh, who is a European researcher in Japan and would like to ask whether he can apply for the ERC as well as grants and uh, he's been listed as highly cited. Uh, it seems that his question is um, most likely relevant only to his individual example, but at the same time, if you could maybe give a few pointers as to whether um, he can have an appointment from a specific university from Europe or what's the actual procedure. And also it seems that uh, uh, when he plans to apply, uh, he will be 64 years old, uh, whether that's um, a hindrance and what can be done. Um, Anyone would like to comment on uh, these questions? Yes, I can answer some of the questions. So um, age is not something that ERC uh, is concerned about. So there are people who even got an ERC advance grant uh, when they were retired. So um, that's not an issue at all. It is important that the, the host organization is willing to give you a contract for the period of the grant. So there could be an issue that if national law forbids you to stay employed by the host organization, then there could be an issue. Uh, on the other hand, I think employers can be quite creative in order to make sure that you still can execute the, pro the project until the end. Um, you do not need to have employment before you're going to submit an ERC. So this host letter in which the host organization is going to um, uh, guarantee that they will give you uh, an employment contract and, and provide all the facilities and support that you need in order to execute the project. This is very important, but that is um, not connected to already having an appointment at a European organization. So. Uh, you can do the application together with the university or the host organization uh, while you are not yet under contract. So I hope that answers at least two of your questions. I'm not sure whether I should also address another question. I think when it comes to whether your track record is competitive, that this is not an easy answer or not an easy question to answer, that we should look into more detail in order to, to see how you want to present yourself, um, uh, whether this read, uh, whether your track record fits your project idea. So I think this is something to, uh, to look into, uh, not during this session, but maybe uh, uh, ask uh, the, the host organization that you would like to apply with for some more substantial advice. Um, I would say you should always consider and look into it and be honest with yourself and maybe also ask some other people for advice, whether they feel that you have a competitive track record and whether they feel that indeed your, your groundbreaking project idea, which sounds like, okay, you can sell everything as groundbreaking, but of course it, it has to, you know, scientifically, it really has to contribute to progress in the field and open up new opportunities. So how can you present yourself as the person, the, the excellent researcher who is going to be the excellent researcher in order to indeed generate these new opportunities? Thank you so much, Laura. And uh, if, if I may just clarify, question. sorry, yeah. sorry, if I may just clarify the, 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 the answer, because there was a following question. Uh, when I referred to researchers, I was uh, I meant um, when applying for a PI position, uh, any Korean researcher or scientist can become a team member at any point. This is up to the PI. Sorry. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Any further questions from the audience? Okay, I don't see any uh, subsequent questions at this point. And also, <clears throat> excuse me, also uh, it seems that uh, we are running a little bit over time. Uh, apologies about that. In any case, if you have any further questions, please send us an email. So um, 
if um, you have any uh, further queries, please send an email to japan at eurosas.net. And uh, I would like to thank you for your kind attention today uh, and our speakers for uh, giving us their time, uh, useful pieces of advice and life experience. Thank you for all the information, uh, a wealth, a, a treasure trove, really. I would like to remind you to follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and also Line, and check out our portals, uh, both the Korean, the Japanese, and the ASEAN portals of Euroxas. Thank you for coming. Wish you a good day or evening, wherever you are. Thank you, and goodbye. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you to everyone. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye. Thank you, Bye -bye, everyone. Dana.